Hi, good morning, everyone. This is uh, Dan Brown. Uh, I'm the Warning Coordination Meteorologist at the National Hurricane Center, uh, broadcasting to you from my home this morning. Uh, but we do have a, a distinguished panel of uh, guests this morning. Uh, we're going to talk uh, about the 2019 forecast challenges and messaging challenges from the from last hurricane season. Uh, we have three speakers today. Uh, the first will be Dr. Mike Brennan. He's the uh, chief of the Hurricane Specialist Unit at the National Hurricane Center. Uh, he'll be followed by Jamie Rome, who's the Storm Surge Team Lead at the National Hurricane Center. And then finally, we'll have Alex uh, Lemers, who is the a warning coordination meteorologist at the Weather Prediction Center who uh, helps the Hurricane Center by providing rainfall forecasts for uh, landfall and tropical cyclones. Uh, so with that, we'll go ahead and get uh, started. Uh, Mike's going to present first. Uh, please, as a reminder, to ask your questions in the question box. Uh, we'll try to take a few questions if there are any between speakers as we transition, but we do want to leave plenty of time today for uh, questions and discussion at the end of the presentations. So please don't be shy. Please ask those questions. And uh, we, again, we want to have a, a real fruitful discussion uh, this morning. Uh, with that, I'm going to uh, hand the, pre uh, the presentation uh, panel over to Mike. So you should see that here, Mike, and be able to uh, grab the screen and show your slides. So uh, go ahead, Mike. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Hopefully everybody can see my, my screen okay. And I I'm just going to give a quick overview of the, the 2019 hurricane season and talk about some of the successes that we noted uh, in uh, you know, handling the various storms that uh, affected uh, land areas and other, other parts of the basin last year, as well as some of the challenges we had, uh, primarily focusing on Dorian, which uh, posed a lot of different challenges through its life cycle. But uh, for those of you who, who may recall, the 2019 season was, was pretty busy. We had 18 named storms. Uh, however, we, didn't, we only had six hurricanes, which is about active about average and three major hurricanes which is also about average so we had a lot of weaker sort of lower end tropical storms that didn't get to hurricane strength last year but it was pretty busy we did have a lot of systems um, obviously the most impactful storm of the year in the terms of the basin overall was dorian which uh, had a catastrophic landfall in the northwest bahamas with wind and surge damage there on abaco and grand bahama uh, we also had hurricanes of berto uh, that affected bermuda hurricane lorenzo affected the azores and the United States had direct impacts from six different systems, including uh, Dorian and Barry, that both made landfall as hurricanes. Dorian and the uh, North Carolina Outer Banks and Barry on the coast of Louisiana. Um, just a quick question to think about: you know, which hurricane in 2019 caused the second most fatalities in the basin and the most in the United States? And looking at this map, you probably would not guess that it was actually. Uh, Hurricane Lorenzo, which uh, closest point of approach to the United States was more than 1,500 miles away. It was a storm that formed, a, actually it's a tropical depression to the southeast of the Cabo Verde Islands, became a tropical storm and hurricane in the deep tropical Atlantic and then recurved between 40 and 45 west, uh, reaching a you know, major hurricane status, and then did go on and accelerate to the northeast and passed uh, near or just to the west of the Azores as a hurricane uh, as we got into early October before undergoing extra tropical transition in the North Atlantic and ending up near the British Isles. Um, but Lorenzo caused a tremendous uh, number of fatalities. Um, there were actually a, a 19 overall. Uh, 11 fatalities occurred due to the sinking of the tugboat Bourbon Road uh, out here in the Eastern Atlantic. There were three crew rescued in that through a pretty exhaustive search and rescue effort that was uh, participated in by by some of the NOAA Hurricane Hunter aircraft that were out there flying Lorenzo, as well as the French. And it was really a multinational effort to try and rescue as many people as they could from that tugboat. Um, this is, a, again, a, a number, again, another in a string of uh, unfortunate marine incidents involving tropical cyclones, going back to the El Faro incident, and now this Bourbon Road, which uh, um, had 11 fatalities. In addition to that, for a storm that never got closer than 1,500 miles to the east coast of the United States, there were eight rip current deaths in the United States, uh, extending all the way from Florida to Rhode Island with a big cluster there in the North Carolina area. So again, these rip current fatalities from these large motion you know, storms that remain well out away from land, but have uh, very, get very strong, have a big wind, large wave field, end up with a, can, can create a lot of fatalities uh, you know, thousands of miles away. And that's something that we as a community still struggle to message, uh, not just for rip currents related to tropical cyclones, but rip current fatalities in general in the US. Um, in terms of uh, the overall successes last year, through the first uh, several storms of the year, uh, the 
this is just a, a chart showing the uh, two-day track forecast error for each of the storms that uh, had verifying 48-hour forecasts from Barry up through Melissa. You can see that the average track forecast errors for most of these systems were quite low. Uh, based on just these storms, the mean two-day track error was about 55 nautical miles, which was below the five-year mean. However, we had a couple of systems late in the season, Pablo and especially Sebastian, that were late season high latitude systems, and in particular, Sebastian, the models and NHC uh, really struggled. NHC had some of its largest 48 hour track forecast errors in the last 30 years. You can see our average track forecast error at 48 hours, mind you, was almost 300 nautical miles. So uh, just to show you that, you know, previous success isn't always indicative of, of, of you know, future performance, and some storms are still very difficult to forecast, in particular storms where we struggle with the representation of the vertical structure of the storm in the models like Sebastian. And, and that gets compounded when the, those storms are then gonna interact with the mid-latitude flow where you can have uh, very large along track errors depending on the depths of the storm and how much it's gonna get picked up in the, in the westerlies or in the mid-latitudes. And uh, that ended up changing the uh, average track error for the entire season quite a bit. It went up from, oh, to about 75 nautical miles just from those two storms influencing the overall statistics for the season. So still can be very large errors at some in some particular cases, even in short time ranges. And we'll talk about a little bit that with Dorian as well, which posed some uh, track forecast challenges. Um, a success that we've continued to see and work with is the use of the potential tropical cyclone advisories. We use them for nine, uh, six systems in 2019, um, several in, uh, four in the Atlantic and a couple in the East Pacific. Uh, we've used it 18 times over the past three seasons, so again, about six per year. That's much more than I think we in initially envisioned when we first uh, put this uh, you know, change in policy in place, which allows us to go ahead and issue forecasts and watches and warnings for systems that are not yet tropical cyclones, but are expected to impact land areas within the, the watch warning time frame. And on average, this has allowed us to provide an additional 17 hours of lead time on the issuance of watches and warnings. You can see it's even greater for some cases for Barry. We got the watches out 24 hours before Barry actually became a tropical cyclone. So again, a lot of extra lead time provided. And this is a, the, the advisory number two for what became Barry here was potential tropical cyclone two. And you can see we had a hurricane watch and a storm surge watch in effect for portions of the Louisiana coast with a lot more lead time than we would have if we had had to wait for Barry to go on and, and become a tropical depression. Uh, now we'll move on to Dorian. Um, Dorian was challenging in many phases of its existence, all the way from Genesis through its uh, early track and the rapid intensification and the intensity forecast, uh, that, that the longer range intensity forecast for the time in which Dorian affected the Bahamas to its uh, track near to, but just offshore Florida and eventual landfall up in North Carolina. Um, going back to short-term track guidance, this is the track forecast guidance for Dorian at 12Z on August 27th. This is right after Dorian had passed over St. Lucia. Uh, you can see that uh, you know, Dorian's, all the model forecasts showed Dorian either moving over Puerto Rico, uh, near the Mona Passage, or over portions of Eastern Hispaniola. But in reality, and, and based on that forecast, we had a hurricane watch, a tropical storm warning in effect for Puerto Rico, Eastern portions of the Dominican Republic. Uh, and we ended up having Dorian move well to the right of that forecast. Uh, it actually tracked uh, and the center sort of reformed after it moved uh, over St. Lucia and the whole guidance shift uh, suite shifted right along with the motion of the storm. And we ended up having to basically issue a pretty short fuse hurricane watch and then six hours later a hurricane warning for the Virgin Islands because Dorian did strengthen to a hurricane as it moved through the Virgin Islands and had a wind gust to 111 miles per hour at St. Thomas. So this is again a reminder that tightly clustered track model guidance is not a guarantee of low track forecast error. Storms still can and do move outside of the entire envelope of the track guidance, particularly weak systems, and especially if you're dealing with some sort of a discontinuous movement or reformation of the center. And then that uh, played into the intensity forecast as well. So this is the intensity guidance for Dorian from 18Z on August 27th. So what you're looking at here, the white symbols show the best track intensity for Dorian every six hours. This is the initial time. The colored lines show the various intensity model guidance that we had to work with. The official forecast is this dark blue line here that was forecasting an intensity of 60 knots in five days. So we were 
uh, you know, a little above probably the model consensus here. Uh, no, none of the models were forecasting a major hurricane. The highest aids were the ships and LGM statistical models. The LGM was up to around 90 to 95 knots. But at the verifying time, Dorian was 160 knots. That's when it reached its peak intensity in the Bahamas. So a 100 knot track, uh, intensity forecast error, which is the largest intensity error NHC's made in the entire time we've been issuing five-day intensity forecasts going back to 2003. Now, the complicating factors there were that the intensity forecast was very tied to the track of the storm. Um, going back and looking at the track model guidance at this forecast cycle, here's where Dorian was to the, still to the southeast of Barbados. All the track model guidance was uh, pretty tightly clustered on a solution of taking the storm near or over Hispaniola in about two to three days. Uh, these are the deterministic models that we're using here at NHC. And here are the ensemble members from the European and the GEFS. You can see that all of them have some substantial land interaction, either with Puerto Rico or Hispaniola. And you can see from the observed track here in the white hurricane symbols, Dorian moved, uh, once it moved across St. Lucia, took a pretty sharp right uh, deviation to the right of all the track forecast guidance, then moved over St. Croix and through the rest of the Virgin Islands and then on up much farther to the north over the southwestern North Atlantic and then into the Bahamas. Now, that raised the potential of several different competing scenarios. So what we were dealing with at this point in time was uh, one scenario was that Dorian moved along the south side of the cone and actually over Hispaniola. And we know that the high terrain of that mountain can result in significant disruption or even dissipation of tropical cyclones. So that was one possibility. The second possibility was that Dorian moves near the official forecast as some sort of interaction with Puerto Rico and Hispaniola, uh, which would result in some weakening, but time for restrengthening. And this would have been a scenario where Dorian would have ended up maybe going through uh, a larger part of the Bahamas chain, potentially restrengthening to a hurricane, and then maybe coming even closer to or making landfall in portions of Florida with that track a little farther to the left. The third scenario was what actually occurred was that Dorian moved north of the cone, avoided all significant land interaction, never had any weakening, and just was able to take advantage of that very uh, favorable environment over the Bahamas and the Southwest Atlantic and as it approached the Northwest Bahamas and resulted in a rapidly intensifying hurricane over the Western Atlantic. So at the time when we were making this intensity forecast, we had to assume that since our official forecast was showing significant land interaction, we had to account for that in the intensity forecast itself. And then we were able to obviously adjust the intensity forecast upward once it was clear that, that Dorian was not going to have that significant land interaction. So those are just a quick outline of some of the more significant challenges and a few of the successes we had in 2019. So um, I'll wrap it up there and uh, take any questions before we turn it over to the next speaker. Hey, thanks, Mike. Um, yeah, I don't see any questions yet. I'll get ready to turn it over to uh, Jamie. Uh, one thing I was going to mention, maybe it help get some of the conversation going and, and folks thinking about questions, is for you to perhaps describe how we use the, both the discussion and our key messages to talk about some of this uncertainty. You showed a few cases where there was a lot of uncertainty or the forecast didn't quite pan out, but oftentimes, again, the Hurricane Center provides information about that and those, uh, those products. So I'll let you describe that while I uh, start handing things over to Jamie. Yeah, thanks, Dan. You know, the, the, the tropical cyclone discussion product, product really allows us to sort of talk about the uncertainty that's there in the forecast and even describe alternate scenarios and what the outcomes of those scenarios might be that we can't really represent in the official forecast because we only have one official forecast. In fact, we did that for some of the early forecasts for what's now Cristobal in the Gulf of Mexico, where uh, we talked about how you know, there was a possibility the system could dissipate initially and, and something else could form over the Gulf of Mexico early on and the key messages is another place where we can try to talk about that uncertainty and, and again keep it focused on the hazards and what the eventual effect of that uncertainty might be on how the hazards are, are distributed both in terms of their magnitude and their location and really focus on the storm surge the wind the rainfall potential and not so much on the details of the official forecast which we know there's errors associated with Sure, I, got, I did get one question, Mike. I'll let you ask this one, answer this one, and then I'll send it over to Jamie. But uh, it says, why were the models so off with Dorian? Well, I think early on, if you go back to Dor Dorian's earliest formation, um, they were expecting a, a weaker system. Some of the global models initially didn't even have Dorian surviving very long, so they kept a weaker, shallower system that moved more to the left and had more of a westward component of motion in the Caribbean. Uh, later on, I think, 
it had to do with that motion over St. Lucia that disrupted the surface circulation. You know, the aircraft had a difficult time fixing the center for maybe six or 12 hours. And then there might have been some convective asymmetry that resulted in the, the center forming farther north. And, um, you know, if the models, the, the global models certainly can't really even resolve the topography of an island such as St. Lucia, it's so small. So they're not going to handle that sort of interaction between the topography and the storm. So once that's uh, the storm sort of tipped over that tipping point and stayed a little bit to the right, then the whole, you know, its interaction with the environment changed. And then you, you basically opened up the door to one of those different scenarios. Okay, thanks. Uh, and uh, please, again, uh, ask those questions. So we'll have plenty of time for discussion afterwards. But thanks, Mike, for the, uh, the review on uh, the uh, Hurricane Center tracking intensity forecast. Uh, next, we'll turn it over to uh, Jamie Rome. Uh, Jamie, again, is the Hurricane Center uh, storm surge team lead. He is going to look at uh, the storm surge forecasts and uh, uh, both from last season and look ahead for the 2020 season. So go ahead, Jamie. Hey, Dan, is screen up okay? Looks good. It is, looks good, thank you. All right, um, we're gonna be uh, building where Mike left off um, with respect to Dorian and some of the successes um, in the storm surge forecast, which were largely predicated on the extremely um, good uh, track forecast that, that Mike um, <clears throat> outlined for you there, as well as, as us being able to work right alongside the hurricane specialists to put those forecasts in, into our modeling system. But quickly, since I'm gonna talk so much about um, what we call a probabilistic storm surge guidance or P-surge. Um, there's a lot of, um, you know, still a little bit of misinformation out there on this particular uh, guidance uh, product. So I wanted to, to go over this quickly. It basically is a slosh with a wrapper around it. And a, the wrapper basically takes the official forecasts uh, from the National Hurricane Center and the standard five-year errors in that um, Forecast and builds these alternate tracks or these alternate scenarios. So in this upper right hand, this is this is a, an Irma scenario where the the official forecast would be down in the middle, and then you build these alternate tracks to the to the left and to the right. Um, the the error distributions are updated um, pretty much annually now to, to reflect the uh, rapidly improving forecast from the National Hurricane Center. And it's not just the track, uh, the cross track, or or the you know th this uh, landfall. Um, location that we're perturbing. It's also the along track or what's called the, the forward speed. And this is especially important um, since we're dealing with tide here. The, the phasing of the peak forcing with respect to high tide is, is really um, important for getting the total water level. It gets increasingly important as you move up the East Coast uh, where you get uh, larger and larger tide variations. We're also um, perturbing the intensity and um, one of the more important um, factors in storm surge that people forget is, is structure, what we call the radius of maximum winds. And it should be noted that um, it is the official national weather service requirement for not only for, the, for a probabilistic solution, uh, not only uh, at the hurricane center, but basically this, this drives the entire um, product suite of the national weather service uh, storm surge products. Uh, both at the Hurricane Center and at the local WFO for, for tropical-based uh, systems. Um, our current requirement is to provide it out to 48 hours, um, it, it, but um, owing to a, a recent investment from Congress, we're going to push that to 72, uh, circa 2022 or 2023. And this data has to be available to us in, in AWIPS. If we can't get it into AWIPS, um, it's just not usable for us. And this little graphic down here on the right, which was uh, provided in our recent NHC blog is probably one of the more um, useful um, graphics I've seen out of the Hurricane Center in a while. And so on, on the y-axis is the traditional um, error in the model, so track error, and then on the, on the x-axis here is consistency. And then we've sort of plotted the NHC official forecast against um, the three most reliable global models here. And you see here that the, the Hurricane Center um, is not only more accurate than um, the other global models, it's also more consistent, meaning it, it doesn't jump around or, or try, you know, move in, in from run to run to run. So you can see why we actually anchor the entire um, storm surge forecast on the NHC official forecast versus these other models. A lot of people ask why we don't run slosh with these other models. And I mean, I think you can, you can see here that the 
the hurricane specialists at the National Hurricane Center just absolutely crush um, all the other uh, spaghetti models out there. So uh, you, you media folks remember this. Uh, you know, we get a lot of calls and, and, and you know, people asking on briefings, uh, what do you think about this model? Or what do you think about that model? Or have you seen this model or that sort of stuff? The, the forecasters here just absolutely crush uh, everything um, out there. Um, so that's what we base our official forecast on. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about uh, a new graphic here that you've probably never seen before. It's called a relative operating characteristic diagram. And this is sort of the way we measure our success in, in storm surge. Um, so you have the, on the y-axis the probability of detection, um, which you're probably used to hearing uh, on, on here on the y. And then the x-axis, you have the false alarm rate. So this is the cry wolf, um, uh, send, the cry wolf indication. So in a perfect world, you want, you'd want to be here on this chart, up in this upper left-hand portion here, which would give you a very high probability of detection, but a very low false alarm ratio. Now, we, we know in reality that we can't perfectly get here. Um, so we have to, we have to balance um, this need to encapsulate the event, the risk of an event, versus this false alarm. So this is a punishing, this is actually a punishing statistic to, to measure yourself against. And um, what you see here is in the red is the 2019 version of P-Surge and um, a new version that's gonna go in production later in 2020. And we'll talk about that in a second, but I kinda wanna walk you through this graphic. Um, so this dotted line right here is, is absolutely no skill and upper upper left hand corner is is perfection. So you're you're constantly trying to go towards this upper left hand corner. So you can see this new upgrade is is actually quite substantial. But we'll talk about that in a second. Um, so if we started up here, these little tick marks here are the zero percent exceedance, ten percent, twenty percent, thirty percent, and forty percent exceedance. So it's interesting here. So a couple of things. So we use the ten percent exceedance to drive just about all of our um, watches, warnings, and, and forecasts. And a lot of people have wrongly characterized that as a worst case scenario. What is not a worst case scenario, that would be a 0% exceedance. So you can see that here on the diagram. Now, if we started at a 0% exceedance, that gives you a, a perfect probability of detection, but you, you know, a terrible false alarm rate. So, the, you know, the only way to get perfection and the probability of detection is to take these extreme risks on the false alarm rate. So, but if you drop down to the 10% exceedance, so you, if you go this way from the 0% exceedance to the 10% exceedance, you slice the false alarm ratio in half, but you only lose a very small percentage of the probability of detection. So you can see this horizontal line here is significantly longer than that vertical line there. And all of a sudden here, it, you start you losing that as you go to the 20 and 30% exceedance, you can see the slope just kind of falls off here. So from a risk reward perspective, um, this 10% exceedance is kind of where you really want to be because it, it, it still allows you to encapsulate the risk of the, of the storm, but without inheriting a, a massive false alarm ratio. So, and if you're wondering, this over here would be like a slosh mom. So the, the, the so this this is a slosh mom and this is the 10% exceedance. So you can see kind of a comparison of the two. The other thing I wanted to show here is a lot of people say, well, why don't you extend your, your real-time guidance out to 72 hours? So I want you to see the same plot if I did it for 72 hours and you can see that it just drops and gets really flat. Um, and drops towards this no skill line. So this this isn't a, a, a fault of the storm surge model as much as it is the, the meteorological uncertainty becomes so large and, and starts to grow. And what happens is from a probabilistic standpoint, it gets really hard um, to get beyond 48 hours. Now, that said, um, emergency managers have uh, communicated to us loud and clear that they really need this. And we're working hard on getting this 72 hour uh, predictability up and again that's um, that's going to be circa 2022 2023 all right so let's go back to Dorian since this is supposed to be a talk about Dorian so if you kind of re uh, reframe your brain here with respect to Dorian if we look if we look at sort of the the GFS uh, ensemble tracks 
uh, the European ensemble tracks and the UK Met ensemble tracks here. Um, you can see how they're uh, distributed about uh, the Florida Peninsula and it was some offshore. So I've shown you this here to sort of give you the full uh, sense of the spaghetti diagram since that's, you know, if you're going to look at spaghetti diagrams, we might as well frame ourselves in that perspective. And then I'm going to add the cone on top of that. Now, what's interesting here is that um, the UK Met was showing um, a, a substantially higher risk to South Florida than the cone did. And inter interestingly enough, the UK Met was one of the best performing, I think was the best performing um, global model at, at the time of, of this forecast. So it was impossible to discredit these, just to fully discredit these. And now I'm going to add the P-Search tracks on top of that. So you can see P-Search tracks in gray sort of encompass this uh, or encapsulate this distribution. Sorry, I'm just pushing my phone away because it's vibrating. Um, all right. And then, um, so he, he, a lot of people ask um, during briefings, well, what happens if this model or what happens if it goes left or what happens as it goes right? Just rest assured that our forecast already encapsulates those scenarios. That's what makes it such a powerful uh, new tool uh, relative to it, old, older methods of deterministic approaches. And then you can see the P-Search track with, with respect uh, to, to the cone. Um, and so, again, I wanted to emphasize this point that the UK Met here, which is what's shown here for Dorian, was one of the best performing um, models during Dorian. So we absolutely could not at the time discredit it. Um, and if you think that was just a fluke, if you look back over the 2019, 2018, and, and 2017 hurricane seasons um, with the GFS, UK Met, and European, and the black is the official forecast, and this particular plot higher higher up, so skill is, is further up on the chart, um, you can see that UK Met is one of the better performing models, but more importantly, like I said earlier, the hurricane um, specialists uh, just crush the best available uh, guidance uh, out there. Uh, so going back to Dorian, why is this even remotely relevant to storm surge? Remember, we've got these, these tracks plowing a, a major hurricane into to South Florida. Because storm surge is predicated, or evacuations in this country are predicated on storm surge risk. And if you look at, if we would have, if Miami-Dade would have, uh, this is Miami-Dade County and this is downtown Miami, um, would have based a, a f their evacuations on a major hurricane moving westward, like the UK Met was showing, um, this is what you would get. Now, if you're not familiar with Miami, this is, this is horrific. Uh, this is, I mean, this is, I mean, this is complete and total overwash of all of Miami Beach and Key Biscayne. This is densely populated uh, suburbs of, of Miami. Um, this, is, this is a large scale mass evacuation of at least a million uh, people. This is the official forecast inundation that we produced from Dorian using P-Surge. And if you're sort of straining your eye to see, it's because there's no water here in Miami-Dade and, and Broward counties. There's a little bit of water right along the immediate coastline, about two to four feet in Palm Beach County, but there's literally no water coming from the P-Surge prediction or the real-time prediction for Miami-Dade and Broward County versus the scenario if it would have plowed straight into the county. So the first thing that you can deduce from this is that P-Surge in the 10% exceedance is absolutely not a worst case scenario. Look at the two deltas here. This is a quite drastic. Um, the other thing is um, this chart on the left is historically what emergency managers would have used before the advent of, of this to make an evacuation decision. And why? And here's Palm Beach County, so you can sort of zoom in and see that two to four a little better. So we actually went back and working with the state of Florida and local EMs, um, went, you know, talked to them and asked them about how they made their evacuation decision. And this is really quite re relevant to the current times. Um, had they made their evacuation decisions on um, those older uh, based systems, um, you could actually calculate the total population that would have been subjected to an evacuation under that particular protocol, about 4.5 million people in Florida alone. 
In actuality, uh, Florida estimated that uh, 1.4 million people were ordered to evacuate during Dorian for a delta of 3.1 million people. So let's put this into perspective here. 3.1 million people in Florida alone, um, those evacuations were stopped or um, mitigated um, by use of this, this newer form of uh, storm surge prediction. Uh, South Carolina had um, similar cutbacks. Um, they, would, they were looking at a, a little over 1.1 million. They actually evacuated about 800,000. Virginia wins the prize. Their zone A population, which is their coastal uh, immediate uh, coastal zone, is 225,000. They only evacuated 3,000 people. I mean, think about this. This is, this is a substantial difference. Um, and if you're asking yourself, where is North Carolina? Um, North Carolina had similar results, but they didn't yet have evacuation zones. They're launching them this year for the first time. Um, and so to keep, keep this fair and clean, I excluded them just so it was a consistent uh, approach. Uh, but if you add all that up, um, almost 6 million people would have been expected to be evacuated. Um, in actuality, just a little over 2, two million. Um, the bulk of that in Florida came from uh, South Florida. Um, Palm Beach County um, executed about 130,000 evacuations. But what jumps off the page here is zero evacuations in Broward County, zero evacuations in Miami-Dade County. Now, you got to think about the geography of Florida here to understand this. Um, you know, I-95 runs north along the state here. If these two counties would have ordered a massive evacuation, all of those people would have gotten in the cars and drove north on I-95 or the turnpike and either severely clogged up the roads, um, taken up hotels and resources, burned up gas, uh, just been a, a huge um, you know, strain on resources. And if you think back, did you recall, or do you, does anybody recall hearing any news stories about traffic jams or people sitting in cars evacuating um, for hours and hours and hours? You know, I don't recall any. And then you didn't hear any sort of fuel shortage issues either, um, despite the fact that a Category 5 hurricane parked itself, you know, 90, 90 miles offshore of, of Southeast Florida. So that's, that's pretty remarkable from a historical perspective. And those of us who've been around, um, you know, like Dan Brown and I have lived down here for a long time, and we've seen these two counties execute evacuations and forecasts like this many, many, many times. So this zero is, is really striking. And we actually talked to the EMs after, um, after the event and asked them, you know, how, how did you not order any evacuations? And, and they sort of looked at me quite strangely and said rather bluntly, because you forecast no storm surge. So you can see you can see how the storm surge forecast really factors into the evacuation. So to wrap this up here and save time for others, um, the, um, the new probabilistic P surge guidance and, and forecasts that are derived there, therein uh, significantly cut um, evacuations during Dorian. Um, and, and it is now the backbone of just about everything we do. Um, it, within 48 hours, we still use the meows beyond beyond 48 hours, and I think I am going to leave it there for for now, so we can uh, let Alex have some time to talk. Thanks, Jamie. Uh, while we switch, I was actually you know it was a, a fantastic summary of Dorian, and I think some of the value added uh, uh, you know, information that was provided from the Hurricane Center uh, when it is for the decision making. But I was going to ask you a, a, one quick question uh, while we switch. Was the other hurricane that made landfall last year was Hurricane Barry? Um, just ask, uh, you know, was there any challenges with those surge forecasts? I know there was some pre-existing conditions with uh, uh, floodwaters coming down the Mississippi that uh, posed some challenges. So I don't know if you want to comment about anything about that. I don't have any questions for you yet, but maybe you comment about that while I switch things over to, uh, to Alex. Yeah, the, the coupling of our modeling systems um, and inundation mapping with uh, river forecasting systems, uh, such as the River Forecast Center and the, the National Water Center, uh, represents the next frontier um, to produce um, one inundation map that encompasses both um, the freshwater flooding, inland freshwater flooding, and the saltwater um, coastal flooding so that EMs don't have to juggle these two maps. Um, we're about two years away from making that happen. In the meantime, um, we couple the systems behind the scenes to make sure that uh, you get a complete risk, risk map. Um, and so, I mean, we're looking at that potential um, you know, for crystal ball, if it, if it were to, you know, move up to the northern Gulf Coast and, you know, we, I've been working with the uh, 
uh, Lowell Mississippi River Forecast Center all morning. So we do have that coupling in place, um, but it'll be another couple of years before we get the full inundation mapping to go with that. Okay, thanks, Jamie. And uh, so now we'll switch over to uh, Alex Lemers. Uh, uh, Alex is going to provide a look at our rainfall forecasting. Again, uh, he works at the Weather Prediction Center. Uh, they provide rainfall forecasting for the, uh, the entire United States. Uh, but again, they provide the Hurricane Center with guidance on those rainfall forecasts and also helps with our messaging. So again, uh, welcome, Alex, and I'll let you provide uh, your summary of 2019 as well. Thanks, Dan. Um, and uh, one thing I'll point out is, uh, you know, we've got a pretty significant rainfall situation going on right now with Cristobal in, in Central America. Um, pretty significant rain totals already in, in some of those countries down there. And um, something maybe not everybody knows is uh, that uh, WPC helps coordinate rainfall statements even outside of the United States uh, with the Hurricane Center. And we do actually have um, an international desk uh, that was formed back in the late 80s. Uh, and primarily they help train forecasters from other countries, but they do uh, work with our, our forecasters to uh, provide guidance for these um, out of the United States areas. So I'm gonna start from the very general and then move to the specific uh, and, and topic of um, tropical cyclones. And these first few maps, I gotta give credit to Greg Carbon. He's, he's a, uh, Pretty good at, at um, making maps like this quickly. Um, 2019 was actually the second wettest year on record for the United States, just short um, of the record year, which I think was 1973. Um, and uh, you can see there's these little circles plotted on this map here that show kind of the state grid maximum. The data source here is the stage four, which is the official verification data set for the National Weather Service. Um, and you can kind of see actually uh, some influence of tropical cyclones here. Um, we have uh, in Texas a maximum actually over 100 inches here in, in far southeast Texas based on the gridded data. Um, and there's uh, the effect of, of Imelda seen there. And then um, in, even moving to Louisiana, there was some influence of, of Barry, one of the bands here. Also in Arkansas, Barry had a, a second maximum up in Arkansas. And in northern Mississippi, there was a couple of storms that affected um, the lower Mississippi Valley. So some of these maxima actually do correspond pretty well to uh, an influence from some tropical cyclones. If you look at the last few years, uh, you'll see it's been pretty wet across the country, generally speaking. And um, we have the long-term mean, which was um, kind of over the last several decades here in the upper left. And so you can kind of visually compare and just see uh, it's particularly 2015, 2018, and 2019, pretty wet. Um, and those, uh, so three of the top five wettest years on record for the, the United States have occurred in the last five years. Uh, and if you look at state rankings um, from NCEI, um, you can see uh, multiple states have set records in recent years. Um, and uh, None really tipped over into a record by tropical cyclones, except perhaps the Carolinas and, and portions of the Mid-Atlantic from Florence in 2018. Um, but if you look at 2019, you can see Tennessee had their second wettest year on record, and then um, Mississippi and Arkansas kind of went into the top 10, and there were a number of tropical cyclones that affected those areas. Uh, these are just the, the primary rainfall footprints. I didn't include everything, but this is just uh, slimmed down to areas with at least three inches of rainfall um, from kind of the primary storms that affected the United States. Uh, I'll start off by mentioning Karen um, affected Puerto Rico. Uh, amounts generally less than six inches were reported there, um, but that's not depicted on this map. So you can see the five storms that kind of affected the southeastern United States most of the rainfall uh, in the southeastern United States with that, and, and a lot of storms affecting uh, the lower Mississippi River Valley. And um, you can see the Barry's rainfall footprint and Olga's kind of overlapped uh, in that area I talked about in northern Mississippi, uh, where they had kind of the highest amounts for the state last year. Um, but uh, Imelda, Barry, and Dorian were kind of the three big rain producers last year. If you look at the individual uh, the, the maps, you can see 
Um, I think Amelda will stand out in the recollection of everybody just for the, the extreme maxima in Southeast Texas. We had over 40 inches of rain observed there. It was actually the seventh wettest uh, tropical cyclone on record for the United States and the fourth wettest in the state of Texas. And, um, and the one thing that kind of consistently cropped up in, in 2019 with respect to rainfall that made it a little bit of a challenge was we had a lot of less organized storms uh, that mesoscale banding played a disproportionate role in the rainfall distribution and intensity. So that showed up in Imelda, certainly. A uh, slow looping storm and, and mesoscale aspects played a role in a training band that kind of set up just uh, off the northeast side of Houston over towards Beaumont. Uh, Barry was a similar, uh, a similar type of storm in terms of the mesoscale influence. Um, and we know that uh, Mike mentioned that the potential tropical cyclone advisory was used for that as it kind of evolved from a, a disturbance that moved out of the southeast and over the Gulf and then formed into a tropical cyclone. And a lot of models actually took that and formed a kind of a concentrated convection closer to the center and, and really had a, a more continuous swath of heavy rain further east uh, in southeast Louisiana up into Mississippi. And what actually verified were these really uh, fine scale bands uh, kind of near and west of the uh, um, the expected rainfall maximum if you just took model guidance verbatim. So we had one that developed in, in Louisiana and another one in Arkansas. And, um, and mostly those actually formed as after the center had passed by. Uh, and that was because there was a lot of instability over the Gulf. It was pretty stable over land. So as the center moved inland, that instability was able to move inland and, and kind of we had these bands develop along the gradients. And as I, I mentioned, this is kind of just a graphic to illustrate the challenge we have with forecasting rainfall, tropical cyclones, uh, and, and there's this spectrum in terms of what to generally expect in terms of the rainfall hazards from, from tropical cyclones. And uh, on one end, you know, we deal with the ordinary. And if you tell somebody a hurricane's coming and it's going to rain, they're going to say, well, that's pretty obvious. And so we, the, the goal is to try and identify the areas that are particularly going to be hazardous. Um, and then on the other end of the spectrum, you have large, slow moving storms where the rainfall footprint is sort of obvious. Uh, really, you're trying to nail down the intensity and the exact placement. But overall, there's a pretty strong signal that you're going to have a, a big event. Uh, but a lot more storms kind of fall in this area in between. A, a lot of them produce these localized hotspots, and that was really the challenge last year, um, that you know there's the potential, just given the environment around a tropical cyclone, the amount of moisture, that there's a potential for these really extreme maxima, but actually pinpointing that is difficult. And so it's tough to get large-scale response to that uh, in terms of preparation. And as we saw with Imelda, the smaller hotspots hot can still be extreme. This is another map from Greg Carbon, uh, who's a branch chief at WPC. And um, it just shows the difference in scale. Uh, we got Harvey on the right here and Imelda on the left. And both of them produced maxima over 40 inches, which is incredible. They're both uh, in, the, in the top 10 wettest storms on record for the United States, but the scale is far different and certainly it's much more difficult to, to really pinpoint where, you, if and where you're going to get the um, the 40 inches of rain from a, a system like a Melda. All it takes is a slightly different, slightly different wind field and, and a mesoscale environment, and you can have the maybe the band drift a little bit more, and, and maybe that will reduce your intensity slightly. Um, all kinds of small scale factors can in, uh, influence the placement of this maxima. Uh, worth noting, Imelda, the $5 billion flood disaster related to a tropical cyclone in the last five years. So we've had all these billion dollar storms recently, and I'd say there's probably about five in the last five years that have had a, a significant contribution of that from uh, rainfall-induced flooding. So Imelda, and then we also had Florence, Maria in Puerto Rico, Harvey, and Matthew. And uh, another thing to mention with respect to Imelda and just generally speaking about rainfall hazards is the expanding bullseye effect. So if you want to know more about that, I'd suggest reading some of the work from um, Stephen Strader and Walker Ashley. And this graphic is from Stephen Strader. He posted it on Twitter after Imelda. 
And it just shows, you know, the change in, in percent impervious surface uh, over the past half century. And you can see, I've outlined the, the, the 20 inch contour based on uh, the rainfall estimates. And um, within that area, there's a lot more development than there used to be. Uh, and, and certainly the land surface plays a big role in what the flood hazard is. Uh, and, and so if you look up to the northeast of Houston, for instance, in these exurbs and suburbs, not a lot of development if you go back to 1950, but there's a lot more there now. And certainly that holds kind of along the I-10 corridor here. And this picture here, uh, this kind of overhead shot, uh, just shows some of the flooding impacting homes residential areas in that area in the Northeast Houston exurbs from Imelda. Uh, now I'm just gonna uh, spend a little bit of time uh, before we wrap it up and take Q&A, uh, talking about kind of WP, WPC forecasting in, in particular. And um, one message is rainfall forecasts continue to improve overall. Uh, and we're adding about a day of skill a decade. And so, uh, on the, the y-axis here, the vertical axis says the one inch threat score, and that's basically measuring the overlap between the one inch objects we forecast and the one inch objects that are observed. And um, that that is tracked, uh, you know, they track tornado warning performance and, and all kinds of things. Uh, and this is the one thing that's officially tracked for, for WPC right now. So we're, we are judged on this metric. And uh, actually last year, we in fiscal year 2019, we did set a new branch record uh, for the day one, one inch threat score. So forecasts generally improving and, and a, a day one forecast uh, in the 90s, uh, or sorry, day three forecast now is roughly the skill of a day one forecast in the 90s. Another way to think about rainfall, um, we know, you know, and I'm gonna get to this on the next slide, uh, we're trying to point people towards uh, the excessive rainfall outlook more, impact focused, probabilistic guidance, but we realize people do like to have that rainfall forecast. They like to know how much is on the way. Um, and so we actually use the verification method uh, that looks at the, the objects and how far, what is the displacement uh, of rainfall objects? So if you, we, we used five inches here. Um, so where we might, forecast a five inch contour and then how far off we were with it. So if you imagine a scenario where you have a storm moving in uh, to Texas and maybe we're forecasting our five inch rainfall objects on successive days like this. Um, we, we looked at kind of the average error in seven recent tropical events uh, and it, it closely tracks the NHC track error actually. And that makes sense. I mean. We tried to coordinate our, our rainfall forecast as closely to the NHG track as we can. It's not even an exact one-to-one -one relationship because some of these uh, mesoscale details do play an influence. Um, but overall, pretty close, about 40 miles or so for a day one forecast and about 80 miles or so for a day two for, or a day three forecast. So, you know, if you're if you're in Texas and you're you know, talking to uh, your viewers or, or uh, interested parties about where the rainfall might end up. Well, if you show them a rainfall map and we kind of have the swath of rain coming up from between Houston and Beaumont up into Northeast Texas, it's worth considering an average error, uh, a cross track displacement um, could put Houston and Dallas uh, in the impact zone for heavy rainfall just as easily as it could be over and Southwest Arkansas, Texarkana, and, and Lake Charles. Um, and it, this doesn't account necessarily for, I, I'm not, I haven't visualized the along track error here, um, but the along track error would tend to either reduce or increase the intensity of, of the rainfall, depending on how slow or fast the storm is, is moving. So if you wanna use deterministic rainfall, that's kind of uh, a stat that you can have in your back pocket just to say, hey, you know, if they're, you know, we're sitting here in Houston, maybe the max isn't over us, but we should still be prepared to receive the heaviest rainfall from the system. So the excessive rainfall outlooks is, is what we're pointing people to more uh, in terms of understanding their risk for flash flooding in a given event. And it generally answers the question, where is the greatest risk of flash flooding on a particular day? And the, the formal definition of the product is, uh, you know, 
the probability within 25 miles of a point of exceeding of rainfall exceeding flash flood guidance. But in practice, you know, we're generally considering, you know, what is the probability of flash flooding within 25 miles of a point? And this is an example from Imelda shown here, all from about the same time, the morning of September 18th. Uh, and you can see there's a general forecast. We're going to get some heavy rain in southeast Texas. But in terms of actually pinpointing the, the specific maximum, uh, that's pretty tough. But you can see the forecasters judged uh, the risk of flash flooding to be highest right in this area of southeast Texas. And indeed, that's where we did get the maximum. Um, so the ERO tends to provide better awareness of, of flash flood risk than interpreting a deterministic rainfall forecast. And you know, going back to the last slide, you there are ways that you can get around some of the uncertainty when you're showing a deterministic rainfall forecast. But really, we're trying to account for all that uncertainty and all these factors when we're drawing the excessive rainfall load including antecedent conditions. Uh, so it's it's not just the rainfall necessarily. Um, and verification generally shows our EROs to be reliable. Down in the lower right hand corner here is a graph showing kind of the probability ranges for the definition for each categorical risk. And uh, so if we're perfectly calibrated, you want a probabilistic forecast to fall in each of these ranges. And generally we see that we do. If anything, we're maybe perhaps a little bit too conservative with our slight and moderate risk areas, they could maybe be a little bigger or issued a little more often, but overall uh, pretty reliable in terms of hitting those probabilistic definitions. And uh, we have looked back to see what the impacts are from high risks in particular. And uh, they tend to be associated with uh, a lot of the fatalities and damages associated with rainfall induced flooding uh, over the course of an entire year, not just tropical cyclones. So about 40%, about two out of every five flood-related fatalities in the U.S. occur on a high-risk day, a day in which we have a high risk in effect. And, and about, um, if you remove Harvey from the signal, just because the damage in Harvey was so substantial, it's probably about 70% of the, the, the flood-related damages in the U.S. occur on high-risk days. So uh, if you see a high risk, uh, it, it is a pretty strong signal to pay attention. And last, uh, just highlighting where kind of WPC fits into the tropical rainfall inf or tropical information flow. Uh, we do coordinate, uh, as Dan mentioned, the rainfall statement in the public advisory and rainfall related key messages in, uh, and you'll get those on the Hurricane Center website. And then uh, some of these graphics you'll see, the rainfall forecast, you're probably all familiar with that graphic. And then recently, I think just last year, we, we have this, uh, flash flood potential graphic, which is this the excessive rainfall outlook, and we can do multi-day combinations. So this graphic can actually show you the highest risk over the next three days. And I will mention we are looking at operational concepts to extend the year out beyond day three. So you may be seeing that sometime in the near future. Uh, just a couple key takeaways. Uh, predictability is going to vary depending on the tropical cyclone. Um, you know, we saw some challenges with Barry and Imelda and, and other storms in terms of mesoscale banding played a disproportionate role in 2019, which made some of the forecasts more challenging, especially the rainfall forecasts. And for that reason, we really do recommend uh, continuing to look in, uh, more at the excessive rainfall over traditional rainfall forecasts for, excess, uh, for assessing the flash flood risk. Um, and, and we're, you know, we're constantly looking at ways to improve the excessive rainfall outlook um, to, to deal with the challenges that we, we have with uh, messaging flash flooding. And I'd say we have momentum on increasing awareness, especially in recent years. We've had a lot of significant tropical cyclone rain events. So we're increasing awareness of the inland tropical rainfall threat and, and let's keep it going. And with that, uh, I guess I'm done and we can start the Q&A, Dan. Thanks, Alex. Uh, great presentation. I learned some things uh, from that presentation. Again, you guys do fantastic work there highlighting that rainfall threat. And, you know, we look back at the 2016 to 2018 hurricane seasons, uh, a vast majority of the fatalities in the U.S. were water related. And uh, most of those, I think more than 80 percent, were actually from inland flooding. Uh, you know, the, the, the uh, ERO graphic, the excessive rainfall outlook is uh, a fairly uh, newer product from WPC. Have you seen the usage of that increase a lot? I mean, again, I, I know you all have tried to really uh, hit that in your outreach. We have as well. Uh, it is something that I really hope folks are going to 
really on a daily basis, whether there's a tropical cyclone or not, because it does provide that useful information. As you mentioned, those high risk days are, are uh, can be quite deadly and uh, quite impactful. So, uh, have you seen more and more folks use use that uh, that graphic and uh, information? Definitely, uh, yeah. The, I've seen the the tropical cyclone graphic get used uh, uh, from some folks on social media and so forth. Um, and I think I've seen it a lot more on broadcast television. Um, whether that's at the local or national level, we do produce, you know, KML files. I know that works with a lot of the graphics systems for broadcast media. So um, we do see that quite a bit now. Um, folks showing the ERO as kind of a way of highlighting the areas that are at, at m most at risk. Um, and, and I think that's a good thing. I think it really does help show uh, more than a rainfall forecast where we're most concerned about impacts to people. Thanks. I'll have to add here uh, that uh, that Robbie Berg has joined me to help moderate. Uh, Robbie is also a hurricane specialist at the National Hurricane Center. And as we get into the question and answers, and I'm a little surprised folks are as shy as they are at the moment. Uh, usually we have a, a, a great discussion at the National Hurricane Center where we cover a lot of these topics. And then uh, the room is uh, usually quite full and uh, there's never a loss for people to ask questions. So. I uh, encourage folks to ask those questions. We have a few that we'll get to here in a moment, but please uh, type those questions in. And, and I just want to thank, again, the National Hurricane Conference for allowing us the opportunity to hold this session. Uh, it's uh, not quite the format that we wanted, but uh, at least we're still able to connect and get together here today. Uh, so Mike and Jamie are also on, uh, uh, and I think I'll send it over to Robbie to, to ask here the, uh, one of the first questions that we've had. Uh, go ahead, Robbie. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Uh, so, Jamie I was talking about a lot of the different uh, storm surge products for Dorian. Uh, we've had a lot of storms, obviously, over the past couple of years, including Michael, Lawrence, and you know, in all those different storms, the environments were quite different. You think of the violent nature in Michael versus in Florence, where you have the surge interacting with the river and the water almost comes up a little bit more gently, I'll say. Uh, so, Jamie, I thought you could, you could talk about some of the upcoming future efforts that the storm surge unit is looking into when it comes to the storm surge environment how would you forecast that yeah that's actually a good question um what we're predicting now is, is the depth of water and the inland extent um, independent of whether waves are or are not present and i think as everyone can imagine here the presence of violent waves on top of a storm surge um, represents a whole nother level of uh, hazardous um, conditions. Um, you need only to look at the the damage uh, after um, Michael on, on Mexico Beach to kind of convince yourself of that. And in fact, I mean, of the of the five deaths we had attributed to storm surge in Michael, all of them were in what I would call the high velocity or wave wave zone. Um, so the the idea going forward is, um, and we now have a version of slosh with with a wave model coupled to it, is to try to do a better job of differentiating or, or, or just adding on top of our existing forecast, which areas would also have the presence of, of violent wave action or high velocity, um, which um, based off our discussions with the emergency manage, management uh, officials um, would constitute a huge improvement because the call to action and um, their, uh, you know, how they, uh, approach evacuations within that high velocity zone would probably be drastically different. Thanks, Jamie. Um, I, there's a question here I was going to send over to Mike, and, but I, I think it uh, was sparked from Jamie's presentation when he showed uh, uh, the, the models that we use and compared the Hurricane Center forecast with some of those global models. Uh, the question was asking about some mesoscale models. I, I think the person was primarily asking about those regional hurricane models that we use, Mike, with uh, HMON and HWARF. Uh, so they're asking, uh, do those still play an important role in the uh, tropical cyclone forecasts that we make? Yeah, um, primarily more for intensity than track. You know, HWARF is certainly is actually part of the multi-model track consensus that we use, but its its track forecast skill is usually less than that of, the, say, the GFS or the other global models. Uh, some of that might be due to the way that the vortex gets initialized and the interaction in that early stage. And then there's also the fact that those are regional area models, so they have to deal with things like boundary condition issues, especially for the longer lead time forecasts that they get up to three, four or five days. Uh, but for intensity, 
the H warp is now actually the best intensity model we have, and that's been a real change compared to you know ten, 10 or even you know ten to twenty years ago when the statistical models, things like ships and LGM, were by far better than the dynamical intensity models of that day, like the GFDL model. So uh, the H warp is now the best piece of intensity guidance we have, and it, it's a very positive contributor to the intensity consensus that we use as well. So it's a pretty valuable uh, model. The Coamps TC model from the Navy is also a pretty strong performer as well in that regard. Thanks, Mike. Uh, next question, uh, I was gonna kind of pass to Alex uh, talking about rainfall. So Alex, obviously WPC has a huge role when it comes to the rainfall forecasts. So, but there are other entities in the weather service that uh, produce not just the rainfall forecast, but then the resulting flooding, whether it be river flooding, flash flooding. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how the WPC interacts with the forecast centers, the WFOs, and now the National Water Center uh, to make one cohesive uh, message about what kind of uh, rainfall and flooding impacts we expect from these storms. Yeah, so we uh, we coordinate with a lot of offices in the Weather Service. Um, you know, just just like any other national center, I know when the, when the Hurricane Center wants to issue a watcher warning, they're coordinating with local offices on that. Um, just like that, uh, we're we're coordinating on both the rainfall forecast and the excessive rainfall outlook with uh, with all the the local offices around the country and the river forecast centers. The river forecast centers are, are um, you know listening to the judgments of of what we have on QPF confidence in terms of uh, how much QPF they may want to put into the river forecasts across the country. Um, and, uh, you know, we do have this new, the newest national center, the National Water Center, uh, and we are collaborating with them more and more every day. Um, so we talk to them on a daily basis now. We have a, a daily tag up in the morning, um, and they do contribute to those key messages in the rainfall statement now uh, in terms of highlighting areas of concern for not only for flash flooding, but for river flooding. And that tends to be more of their focus. Um, and one thing I'll, I'll mention, uh, kind of the way Mike was talking about the, the models, uh, I saw some parallels with the uh, rainfall models in terms of, you know, the most skillful pieces of guidance we tend to see are the multi-model consensus. And that tends to be kind of where we tend to stick close to in terms of rainfall forecasting. And then we do get these high-res models like the h warp and stuff that really can bring out the potential for these maxima. What, what is the potential intensity of the rainfall and they really help us with that. Of course, the placement of that is, is always a little uncertain, but um, there are some parallels in terms of how we use the models in, in doing our rainfall forecasting. Thanks, Alex. Um, I have a couple questions here for you, Jamie, that uh, has talked about one specific asking about uh, what was the highest storm surge for Dorian in the Northern Bahamas, uh, and then uh, and, and did those search forecasts verify? And there's a second question uh, that's more broad, but talking about uh, uh, does doing performing post-storm analysis, uh, does it help your search unit, uh, you know, see how the, how the work uh, they do uh, uh, helps? Uh, does it help you uh, to improve? And uh, does it help the understanding that each storm uh, is different? So I'll let you answer those. Um, unfortunately, we don't have the, the same types of uh, observational systems in the Bahamas that we enjoy um, here in, in the U.S. So, um, you know, USGS often goes out and deploys um, these instruments out in front of a bigger surge event. So we have that and then we have high water marking and then we have um, in situ observations from um, NOS uh, tide stations. That as well as we have hindcast that we can run slosh and sort of uh, a backward looking perspective and, and really get a high detailed, um, highly resolved depiction of the surge. We don't have that, that all of that type of information uh, for um, the Bahamas, but what we can say, um, looking at some of the images you, you probably also saw on social media, um, it was it was clearly over 20 feet. Um, and so, uh, to, you know, how much more than 20 feet is, it, it's hard to know because you would have to really get out and survey the, the individual house where that particular footage um, occurred. Um, and the second question, I assume, it, it, Dan, you might have to clarify for me, it pertains to the actual when we, the Hurricane Center, go out into the field and do post-storm surveys or were they talking about something else? 
Uh, I think they're asking about, yes, about the hurricane centers. It says, uh, how has post-storm surge assessment helped the surge units yeah. see their work, understand what materialized and how to improve with the understanding that each storm is different? There's uh, there's two benefits of this. Uh, first and foremost is, um, and Mike typically goes with us on these as well, um, we take a lot of time to actually speak to um, our, our constituents, not only the emergency managers and media, but um, in often cases, survivors. Um, and this uh, grounds you, I think, it grounds you personally in in the the significance of what we do and how critically important it is for life safety. Uh, it's very humbling and, um, I mean, it gives you a sense of drive and, and mission that you just could not derive from any other source than to hear from a survivor that, you know, in often cases they'll tell us that they evacuated based off something explicit they saw or heard from the Hurricane Center or the National Weather Service. Um, on the scientific side of things, um, it's because of all those instruments that we talked about just a second ago, um, I, I don't know that we collect specific information regarding the depth of the surge. There's a little bit of that, but it's more the environment that Robbie was alluding to earlier, is trying to differentiate between these, these high velocity areas versus um, still water flooding. Often we don't get that information in the um, the data sets that and so as we're starting to resolve or um, verify these this new version of slosh with waves we really need to, to understand where the high velocity zone was and, and make sure that it performed well and I know, mike might have some additional um uh, comments too because he typically goes on yeah no i'll just second the fact that you know i think how important it is to go see what happens on the ground both from a water and a wind perspective and we had the opportunity to even do an overflight over the bahamas after dorian which i think was really valuable because we had seen pictures you see limited snippets of what's happened on social media or on the internet but to see sort of the scale of it that you can only really get from the air and actually being there and seeing the the scope of the surge and then the wind damage as well i think is is really valuable and, and again talking to the customers is an important part of that as well and getting feedback on what worked what didn't work what did they use to make decisions it helps us to you know refine what we do and uh, you know develop future products and, and take that all into account when we come back okay thanks guys uh, next question uh, somebody just mentioned that uh, ken graham yesterday in the general sessions uh, talked a little bit about some of the new additions to some of the products uh, that we'll be seeing this year. So actually this might be just passed with Mike and Jamie. Uh, Mike, specifically they were asking about the 60 hour forecast point to give a little bit more detail about why is that so important. Uh, and then Jamie, I guess maybe you could talk about the new experimental product that's going up this year. So Mike, you go first. Sure. Yeah, we've, uh, you know, last year we actually experimented in-house with a 60 hour forecast point. As most people know, we had our forecast you know, times are, you know, in the advisory are 12, 24, 36, 48, and then they would skip ahead to 72, 96, and 100. Uh, going in between, putting something in between that 48 to 72 hour point is, is we found it's been pretty useful, um, especially for systems that are expected to reach land within that sort of two to three day time frame. It allows us to indicate a little more detail to the intensity forecast, for example, if we expect a system to be strengthening all the way up through landfall, we can indicate that uh, with a little more temporal uh, you know, precision there with that 60 hour information. It also allows us to show any sort of change in track that might happen at that time. But the most important thing it does is it helps the probabilistic hazard information. It really does help P surge uh, and to again to better reflect the changes in the storm that are occurring in that two to three day time frame. It helps the wind speed probabilities. And that's such a critical decision making time for evacuations and other preparedness information. We felt like including that was a, a really positive step forward mostly for the, the probabilistic hazard information I, i'm not terribly interested in including a lot of additional deterministic forecast points because I, I think they don't really help in themselves but when they help the probabilistic hazard guidance i think they they can pay benefits there yeah dan and um i'll follow up on that if you toss me back the uh, control i've got an image of the new graphic um what mike's talking about the 60 hour forecast absolutely improves um p surge um, we've tested it internally for, I believe, a year or two, Mike, before we, you know, went live with it. So we were able to um, be pretty confident um, of its abilities. And I'm going to, the second part of that question, I'm going to bring up a slide here. Uh, is it up, Dan? 
Uh, yes, it is. You might want to put it in uh, full screen. PowerPoint. PowerPoint mode. All right. Um, so um, the, the, there's a starting this year for 2020. Um, I think many many folks who are familiar with the Hurricane Center products uh, will recognize that we had uh, these values in the public uh, advisory, the text advisory for you know gosh decades I would think now um, that, that attempts to communicate the uh, on a regional scale the peak surge that could occur within a, a stretch of the coastline. We're starting this year. We're going to put a, a graphic uh, to that. Um, you know nowadays people really don't consume information that way as much as they do in, in, in graphics and visuals and social media. So uh, we wanted to freshen up that the delivery. It's really the same information. It is, there is no, it's the exact same values that have always been in the public advisory. It's just a graphical depiction of it. Um, and, and the thing to remember here is it's, it's an aerial threat, you know, somewhere within the specified area. So this three to five feet between Flagler in Savannah River, it doesn't mean everyone is going to get three to five feet. It just means that someone is going to get three to five feet. And the reason is because, um, you know, think about a, a, a like a Dorian case, a shore parallel uh, situation. Well, uh, some of the peak winds are going to occur at high tide in some places and low tide at other places. The the tide goes from high to low in this area on in about you know six hours here, and so timing this this peak winds or onshore winds with the tide is impossible so if the peak winds onshore at high tide here this spot gets three to five but you know maybe this spot down here doesn't well there's no way to know that and so that's the way to um, interpret it as has always been the case this is not new here um, this is this includes high tide it's it, it's it, it, it assumes a high tide scenario um, for the areas I alluded to this earlier that have a significant wave setup, such as Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands, our modeling now has that. So, you know, don't add more water to our forecast. It's, it, it includes um, setup. And, uh, you know, a lot of people have asked since we've launched this, you know, why do, why do we have this when we already have the high resolution inundation mapping? Well, the high resolution inundation mapping is really good for community scale um, risk. So like a county or municipality, but often when we're briefing at a regional level, so like, you know, when Mike and I brief uh, FEMA or um, a lot of our, our, our bigger media partners that span a large geographical area, so like national media, um, the, that graphic, that inundation graphic is, is, is hard to show on, on television and it's certainly not uh, social media friendly. So this is, I think, um, it helps to show a regional. So the, the way to, to use these two together is you can see the regional risk and then you can zoom in on an area of interest using the high resolution inundation mapping. So for example, you would brief this overall risk and say, well, the, the highest risk is you know here from Isle of Palm to, to Myrtle Beach. And then you could zoom in with the high resolution inundation graphic and really see the details of that at a community level. Thanks, uh, thanks, Jamie. Uh, I have a question here. Uh, it's a really good question. Uh, perhaps we can briefly describe uh, how uh, the hurricane forecast is made, and then kind of the role of the forecaster uh, when it comes to interpreting and using model guidance. And I was really going to start with Mike, but then after you describe how we make the track intensity forecast, uh, then actually send it over to both Jamie and Alex and let them describe how. Uh, that information is then used for storm surge uh, forecasting and, and rainfall forecasting. So I'll start with you, Mike. Sure. Yeah. And with, as with any forecast process, it always starts with an analysis of the data we have um, in terms of, you know, whether we have aircraft data, radar, just satellite data, ship and buoy observations. We're always trying to come up with our best initial analysis of the storm's location, its uh, intensity in terms of the peak uh, sustained surface winds, the central pressure, the size of the storm. And then we basically take in all the dynamical model guidance. We're talking about track forecasting now, and, and that all gets adjusted and interpolated to our in, uh, analyzed initial position, say for at 12Z. And then we usually start by you know trying to maintain some consistency, as as was shown earlier by Jamie with the you know our our NHC track forecast. I mean, we try to impose some continuity on it so that we don't make these big changes from cycle to cycle. So we typically start with the previous track forecast. Then we'll look at the consensus or this blend of the best track model guidance that we have, the, the three main global models, the GFS, the European, the UK Met, and the HWARF. 
some of the other guidance. And those models combined together on average do a better job than any one model does individually. And we'll usually try to trend towards the newer multi-model consensus uh, from the previous official forecast. That's sort of how it typically is done, although it's not always the case if you think that models are changing too much or there's reason to not believe a trend, you might stick with the official previous official forecast for a cycle or two and then make a big a big adjustment if you're only if you're really confident that the trends are going to have, have persisted over several model cycles so we don't end up with some sort of windshield wipering effect where we move the track in one direction and then have to pull it back if the model shift around because as the graphic jamie showed indicated the models are obviously free to to be as inconsistent as they want to be from cycle to cycle but the, one of the biggest roles of a human forecaster for the track forecast is to impose that continuity and uh, make that forecast as consistent as possible. On the intensity side, it's much the same thing, even though the uh, uncertainty is typically much larger. We're again using a blend of the best model guidance that we have from the statistical and the dynamical models and then intensity consensus, and again, making adjustments toward that new consensus from what we inherited from the previous forecast. But obviously, since the initial intensity is much more volatile, it can go up and down very quickly. We typically make bigger adjustments to the intensity forecast from cycle to cycle than we do with the track. And we have started to make some progress on uh, you know, improving intensity forecasts you know, on an average basis, really for the first time in this last decade. After many, many years of saying the track forecasts were getting better, but the intensity forecasts weren't, we can finally say the intensity forecasts are starting to get better even though we still do have challenges with rapid intensification for cases like Dorian and others that I've shown. We're more aggressive in showing uh, significant strengthening, but, uh, but uh, many times getting the timing of when RI is going to start, how long it's going to last, is a, is a big challenge when you're making a deterministic forecast. If you're off by even six or 12 hours, you can rack up some huge forecast errors. And obviously, those are very important uh, forecast parameters to get right for getting the distribution of the hazards correct, things like storm surge, the wind, fall, the wind uh, intensity potentially, and then also the timing of when you're gonna issue watches and warnings, how big is the wind field, where do those watches and warnings go, and how do you message that threat information there. So, so the, the human still has a pretty significant role in all aspects of the forecast process, from doing the analysis to um, you know, interpreting, knowing the strengths and weaknesses of the different pieces of guidance we have, uh, to sort of ensuring that consistency from cycle to cycle. And Jamie, do you have anything to add to, from the storm surge perspective? Uh, I mean, that that graph um, we showed earlier um, in, in Mike's explanation, um, because the hurricane specialists do such a good job and they beat everything out there. I mean, I can't emphasize enough that they beat every available piece of information out there. Um, our storm surge forecast is 100% anchored um, to that um, and but more importantly um, because we're working so closely with the hurricane specialists in fact I think they want to kick me off the ops floor some days we're out there so much um, we're able to dynamically adjust in what we extract from that guidance um, or even sometimes how we run the guidance uh, is uh, can dynamically adjust to what Mike and the hurricane specialists are telling us um, especially as it pertains to structure. Structure is um, the, um, the, the part of storm surge that everybody um, doesn't appreciate. Everybody's enamored with the track and intensity, but structure is often more important in some cases and the structure information and they're, that they're deriving from the aircraft as well as their structure forecast um, really plays heavily into um, what we do. It, it's, it's very tempting, the modelers, the storm surge modelers of the world, they, they like to grab some atmospheric model and, and slap it on some storm surge model and, and call it something great. Um, I, I can assure you that that approach will, will never beat a, a human generated uh, forecast. So that's kind of how we do it in storm surge. And Alex, over to you. Yeah, so for from the rainfall forecasting perspective, as I said earlier, the, the most skillful pieces of guidance tend to be these multi-model consensus uh, blends, and, and that's kind of the direction uh, for deterministic forecasting in the weather services. You kind of initialize with a blend, and then you find um, these targets of opportunity where you can, can add value, and, and one of those targets is, uh, is our hurricanes and tropical cyclones. Um, and really, we try to stay as close to the NHC forecast in terms of progression of the storm as possible. 
So we're always looking at, at what they're producing uh, and, and they produce these internal forecasts first before they're published. So we'll use those to kind of line up where their points are, uh, which models may be performing best in terms of the progression of rainfall there. Um, but you know, storm structure is also very important for rainfall. Uh, if, if it's a more disorganized storm, if it's a large, well-organized major hurricane, those play, play roles. Uh, finding instability, um, particularly in, in the shorter time frame, when we can, even if it's a disorganized system, we might have more confidence on where instability gradients may be, and that can help focus focus rainfall. So I'd say overall, we try, generally try to start with a blend and then work from there. But with hurricanes, we tend to start from the hurricane forecast and, and try and consider what the storm structure will be. Uh, and, and there's some other conceptual models that can play a role. For instance, uh, predecessor rain events. If you have a, a recurving tropical cyclone that's interacting with a trough, you can oftentimes get these heavy rain bands way, well downstream of the, the storm. It could be making landfall in the Gulf and you might have a heavy rain event ongoing in the Ohio River Valley that's uh, connected in some way to the tropical cyclone. So um, all these sorts of things, forecaster experience and expertise related to that do play a role. And finally, you know, we do spend quite a bit of time looking at the large scale pattern, especially out in the medium range forecast. So we do offer our thoughts on that to the Hurricane Center when they're putting together their forecast. They are obviously the ultimate authority on putting that together, but um, they do coordinate with our medium range forecasters. Okay, thanks everybody. Uh, next question I was gonna pass to Mike. Uh, Mike, someone's asking about what's the latest with ICA, the HIP corrected consensus model that we use, and will the output ever be made available to the public? Yeah, we update, you know, HICA is sort of our in-house version of a sort of a corrected consensus approach where we try to bias correct uh, model guidance, um, you know, from you know, from various sources and, and sort of use it in a smart way where you might emphasize one model over another based on its past performance in certain situations. Um, we do update that every year because the, the input models change every season for the most part. You know, the h is different this year than last year. The European, the UK met, the GFS tend to get upgraded on almost a yearly basis. Uh, right now, there aren't any plans to share that publicly. Um, that's an inter it, It's available publicly in the decks that we post after the season is over so people can, can see it, but it's not something we're uh, allowed to share in real time at this point. Thanks, Mike. I got another one I was going to send over to you uh, talking about some of the verification here. It says uh, uh, that it's pretty straightforward seeing how NHC uh, performs global model verification. Uh, but how does it keep track of an intensity uh, track and intensity error for different ensemble suites? Well, right now we tend to focus on the deterministic model verification. We'll also verify against ensemble means for track, uh, but we're not usually really using ensembles. There aren't really many operational ensembles that are available to us for intensity forecasting in terms of single model ensembles. We do look at the ensemble mean performance of the GEFS and the European ensemble, as well as the UK Met. For track, we do get all of those in, internally in-house in, in real time, and they are you know, usually pretty skillful. But uh, we're not usually really using ensemble means for intensity yet. There isn't much in the way in terms of the global models. They don't have the resolution yet with their ensembles to properly capture tropical cyclone intensity, and and uh, the regional hurricane models don't really have operational ensembles yet at this point. Uh, next question I was going to send to Alex. Uh, there's a question about the NEXRAD sites and how well they perform during the tropical system of getting rainfall depictions. But I was going to kind of broaden that topic a little bit to see if you could discuss how you take radar data and gauge data and come up with your post analyses after the storms, especially when you're getting ready to do your verification on the rainfall forecast. Yeah, so the, the rainfall maps that I showed, uh, that's uh, uh, for individual storms. That, that was actually a project started in the early uh, aughts by uh, one of our forecasters. And he goes through and maps all of the, the rain events from different tropical cyclones. And that's actually based almost entirely on reports, whether it's gauge data or cocoa ROS. Uh, and, and he does look at you know the, the radar estimates to a certain extent to kind of fill in the gaps and, and interpolate, but that's all kind of engineered uh, at a core level from, from reports and the maxima that are associated on the maps with each of those and the state records for tropical cyclone rainfall, those are all 
derived from uh, actual reports. Uh, verification at WPC is done by comparing the stage four rainfall data, and that is, um, as I mentioned earlier, that's an estimate. It's produced actually by the River Forecast Center. So they um, use the, the radar estimates and they kind of correct for some biases, and that becomes the official verification data set for the Weather Service. Uh, in real time, actually, that's one of the, the strengths of our MetWatch desk. Uh, we have a desk that kind of like the Storm Prediction Center does these mesoscale discussions. Ours are focused on heavy rainfall. And many times you'll find details about how the radars are estimating um, rain rates. Uh, are the dual pole estimates, for instance, too high or too low? And uh, it's hard to draw sweeping conclusions. Um, but uh, it, so we kind of have to take it on a case by case basis. And uh, if you're interested in radar uh, signatures um, in tropical cyclone rain bands, I know there was a paper recently, I think that came out in, it was one of the AMS journals, I can't remember if it was uh, weather and forecasting, but they looked at uh, radar rain signatures in Harvey and they found kind of this uh, coincidence of a certain reflectivity and specific differential phase and, and differential reflectivity uh, when when precipitation was at its most efficient. Um, and so, you know, we're looking at applying certain techniques like that uh, in real-time models right now. Thanks, Alex. Um, I, we're getting close to the end of our session here today, and I think there might be one more question we want to get to that was on there. But I was going to ask one here. We didn't get a lot into the to messaging today, which I know is part of this. Usually when we're at, there in person, a lot of people do uh, ask about messaging and, and things. So I was going to ask a, a, maybe a two-part question here is for each of the hazards and kind of go around the, the, the you know, panelists here, um, what, what's the biggest, I think, challenge that you have in messaging your particular hazard that you're focused on? Alex, you with rainfall, Jamie with surge, and Mike with the wind and uh, you know, track forecast. And then, you know, what is that biggest challenge? And then what would you say to an emergency manager media, uh, how they can help us to do better at messaging uh, that uh, uh, thing that you think is the most challenging? So uh, I hate to put you on the spot, but I'll start with Mike. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest challenge is there's still too much attention paid to the exact details of the official forecast. Um, obviously, if you have a uh, you know, a major hurricane, the core winds, the very worst winds in that eye wall may only cover an area that's, you know, 10 to 15 miles away from the center. So uh, even a day out, you can't really pin down exactly where those winds are going to occur. We issue our hurricane warnings, for example, and take into account the uncertainty in the uh, forecast of the track and the structure of the storm when we lay out that warning area. And so uh, we expect those conditions to occur somewhere in that area, but we don't really know where those worst conditions are going to occur. So again, too much of a focus on sort of small changes in the track forecast, a 10 mile shift to the left or the right. When you're dealing with the, you know, where the core impacts of a major hurricane are going to occur from wind perspective are, are almost really meaningless up until you get down to the last few hours, uh, because the average track forecast error, even one day out is 35 or 40 miles. So uh, again, too much attention to the details. The wind speed probabilities, uh, focusing on the probabilistic products for wind and for all the other hazards is probably the best way to go. And to again, understand that, that the detail, that's the level of detail that's shown in the official forecast and things like deterministic wind grids is not really representative of what the true threat is at most locations uh, in that type of situation. For storm surge, it's a similar similar vein. Um, people focus often on the wrong things um, when it comes. They'll in briefings, I'll be asked about the European model versus asked about what the forecast means. Um, and it's a shame that we we uh, expend precious oxygen during briefings on on those types of questions when there's so much information that can be deduced and talked about from an interpretation of the risk. Um, so the second part of that question is people often have a, a hard time interpreting risk-based products or risk-based forecasts. They, uh, for example, if you look at our storm surge forecast, they interpret that as either a worst case, which it isn't, or uh, like a deterministic forecast. This is like what you expect. Um, and uh, owing to the presentation we talked about earlier, it's, it's, it's a risk-based forecast or risk-based approach using a 10% exceedance where uh, a worst case scenario would be a 0% exceedance. So it's clearly not that. Um, and people often have a hard time 
interpreting that? Because I think most people naturally view the world in a binary perspective, yes or no type thing. Um, am I going to get hit or am I not going to be hit? Am, am, is my house going to get wet? Is my house not going to get wet? And we have to switch it to a more risk-based perspective. And uh, from the WPC perspective and, and rainfall hazard in particular, um, kind of in a similar vein to what Mike and Jamie already talked about, I think focusing on the, on the right things is a, is a big issue. And I know there's some cases when it's tough to get attention on the inland rainfall hazard. I think we've made big strides in that in recent years. Um, certainly a, a lot of credit to the Hurricane Center for finding ways to elevate that message on their website and in their official products. But, you know, we go in these advisory cycles and it's, you know, what is the central pressure? What is the maximum wind? And, and you may have a situation like a Harvey or Florence where the screaming message is there's a ton of rain and water coming and, it, and it's going to be really difficult to deal with. Um, so, you know, that's always kind of a big challenge and, and particularly for areas further inland. Um, Sometimes it's a remnant system or even just a depression way inland. I think back to Tropical Storm Lee in 2011, produced major flooding disasters in the mid-Atlantic in Pennsylvania, well after it made landfall on the central Gulf Coast. So, um, you know, kind of uh, differentiating when, when flooding, inland flooding is the big hazard, I think is, is a challenge, and then kind of identifying those areas inland where people may not be even thinking they're going to have a major disaster on their hands. Okay, thanks. Uh, looks like we're just over 12 o'clock, but there was one more question we wanted to get in before we wrapped up. Mike, I'm going to this one with you. Uh, someone's asking about the six and seven day forecast that we've been practicing uh, internally at the Hurricane Center. And any time estimate on when it's either go public with these forecasts, um, and also let you discuss the other factors that we have to consider before that would become a possibility. Sure, yeah, we've been making the house uh, you know, six and seven day forecast now for most of the last, I'd say, five or six seasons. Uh, you know, on average, the track forecast errors, for example, are line up pretty well with the, uh, the average track errors increase of 30 to 40 nautical miles a day. So the average error is catching us really good. The challenge we deal with at six and seven days are the really large outliers that, uh, where you can have the extremely large track forecast errors. And, one of the challenges there is how do you determine, how do you depict a six and seven day forecast in a way that can show some sort of threat, but again, not be too focused on the exact details of where the center is forecast to be. Uh, because say for example, in Florence, we had some six and seven day track forecast that showed Florence recurving well to the east of Bermuda. All the model guidance indicated it at that time. Uh, if that had been a public product, um, you, you wonder how people's perception of the eventual threat to the U.S. East Coast might have changed or might have been written off very early on and then would have had to do a lot of work to reestablish that threat as the, as the forecast changed and, and became more you know, confident that there was going to be a U.S. impact. Um, yeah, so that's one challenge is how to just display and pick that information. Another challenge is we don't have a lot of guidance filled out that goes out to six and seven days for track. We we're, we're basically have the global models and the ensemble means. For intensity, we actually, just this year, we have the shifts in the LJ models that go out to seven days. So that's the first time we've ever had any explicit intensity guidance at day six and seven. We don't have any of the regional hurricane models going out that far. So for the intensity forecast, we would probably like to get some more model guidance. We would need to do things like extend the wind speed probabilities out to seven days. So there's a lot of work that would have to be done so that when we decide to go public with a six and seven day forecast, we're not just putting a deterministic forecast out there without probabilistic information. It's very important for those longer lead time. And with careful thought from the social science perspective as to how we're going to depict that type of forecast information at a long lead time so that it's useful to people, but not uh, doesn't create such a focus on the deterministic detail that it's, it's you know, it, it loses its value. Thanks, Mike. Uh, I think we're out of time here. Uh, again, thanks uh, for all those great questions you sent. Uh, again, it allowed for a really great discussion this morning. Again, I uh, want to also thank uh, uh, the organizers of the National Hurricane Conference for uh, helping us put this together. Uh, and again, uh, being able to at least have uh, this forum this year. Again, uh, it's very disappointing that we all couldn't be in person a couple of months ago, but glad we at least be able to do uh, to this session. 
Uh, I'll say that Jamie has a, a session plan next week uh, to talk about updates to the storm surge program. So join us for that one as well. Uh, but again, just wanted to thank uh, Mike, Jamie, and Alex for joining us this morning and Robbie uh, for helping me moderate. Anybody have any uh, final words before we sign off? Okay, thanks everyone. Thanks, uh, thanks again for joining us.